Yes. Perfect. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Lizzie's given a great introduction. Yes, I've been at Queen Mary now for uh, almost a year and a half, um, and it's been a great environment uh, to explore some of these questions. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the work I've done over the past several years. I'm an epidemiologist by background, so a lot of uh, this work is around pragmatic uses of routinely collected electronic health records data to examine inequalities and ways that we're using linked data and novel methods to move forward from that. So I'm speaking to the, the converted here, but we know it's so important to capture inequalities related data in all of the work we do. A lot of the clinical guidelines that we use both in the UK and internationally really draw heavily on clinical studies and trials from populations of predominantly white populations and predominantly from high income countries. And this means that the clinical guidelines that we use are not tailored to the needs of diverse populations, particularly those residing in low and middle income countries. So we are in a time period where we are increasingly uh, having access to high quality data from across the globe. And these are absolutely essential to redress the underrepresentation of diverse populations in clinical research, and perhaps most importantly, to uncover potential patterns of disadvantage and racism, which may otherwise remain insidious. And in the context of healthcare, ethnicity and related to demographic data provide a useful lens through which to identify population groups between whom disparities might exist. So I'm going to talk a bit about my work around ethnic inequalities. That's been the bulk of, of my research to date. Um, and so I will just lead you through some of that. So it's probably first easiest to define ethnicity by what it's not. Historically, the term ethnicity was used synonymously with race, um, the belief that humankind is made up of biologically distinct subgroups. However, these races, uh, these, uh, these uh, theories have now been widely discredited. Um, and we know that actually ethnicity is a much broader social construct, which can include some aspects of genetic diversity, but we know that this can vary as much as within races, as across races, as people used to define them previously. And this does not preclude the existence of important genetic variations and health outcomes, which I will speak about a bit later on. <clears throat> so instead, we now understand ethnicity much more holistically to reflect an individual's own self-identification, which encompasses a broad range of socially constructed characteristics, some of which are highlighted in this diagram here. So including, but not limited to our biology, our experiences of ancestry and migration, our beliefs and behaviors, our language and culture, and our experiences of racism and discrimination. And these factors are very important that they are situated within the geography and politics of a specific time period. And the definition of ethnicity may vary across of these dimensions. So the fact that these uh, socially constructed characteristics and biological uh, characteristics may manifest unequally between different population groups is what we can consider to be conceptualized as ethnic differences. And we're very lucky in the UK to be one of the only European countries which actually mandates the collection of ethnicity data in the census and across all government bodies. Um, and indeed in many countries in Europe, the collection of ethnicity related data is considered illegal. And so there, it isn't possible to look at ethnic inequalities uh, in health or social outcomes in a lot of other countries. So as, as mentioned, because of the, the social nature of the concept of ethnicity, there's no one universally accepted definition. It is context dependent. And so we need to consider the social, cultural and political landscape when we use the term ethnicity. However, that isn't particularly useful for us as researchers trying to do work which we can compare across settings, which we can use in different uh, domains. So we have to operationalize the term ethnicity into practical categories with the understanding that this simple category actually encompasses a rich variety of concepts. And we see these categories in places such as the census or when you register with your GP, for example, and the categories that we're given they're not natural in any way, but they reflect groupings which are relevant to a particular time period and context. 
And the census is a great example of this because we see that in every 10 year census round, the number and the definition of categories grows and changes to reflect the demographics of the population at the time. So I'm going to talk about five main considerations when doing research with ethnicity related data. The first is thinking about the social context in which ethnicity is defined. The second is thinking about biases in the capture of ethnicity data in healthcare settings. The third is thinking about the categorization of codes. Fourth, how we conceive of these codes in epidemiological models. And five, how we've used methods for dealing with missing ethnicity data. So firstly, in the social context, this relates to the earlier point that the ethnicity classification that we use actually reflects how people have been racialized. And what I mean by this is how their ethnic identity has been shaped by historical and political forces. And this means that we really need to think about the trust gap in when people choose to give their ethnicity data to researchers, to healthcare providers, or to any um, large body. There are legitimate concerns about the misuse of personal data, and therefore it's absolutely essential that we involve people in research and build public confidence. And this trust in data may also relate to biases in the capture of ethnicity data. So in electronic health records, people may be asked about their ethnicity when they come to the GP, when they have a health check, or when they're attending for some other uh, condition. And this means that the data quality and completeness of ethnicity data in routine records are affected by who attends primary care, whether that person feels represented by those standard categories from the census, and whether or not ethnicity recording is financially incentivized. And for about 10 years, the recording of ethnicity and first language uh, received a financial payment under the quality and outcomes framework in the UK. And during this time, we saw a massive increase in the completeness of ethnicity data from about 26% before incentivization to about 88% after the incentivization. So we can see that actually allowing uh, clinicians to get some financial incentive to record data that is really important socially can have huge benefits, not just for research, but for care as well. But we also have to think about why ethnicity are, data, are missing. And so people who don't have their ethnicity recorded, maybe people who are less likely to attend health services. And this can be for a range of reasons. These people may be healthier, younger, with fewer conditions, which require regular monitoring. But they also may be more mobile. They may be students, people without fixed abode, people who are asylum seekers who may not have the opportunity to access health care. And also there may be groups of people that are less likely to be asked about their ethnicity. And depending on the setting you, or the time pressures that the GP has, there may not be the uh, opportunity or it may not feel right to ask about ethnicity in that particular moment. And this has important implications for inclusion in research, which uses routinely collected uh, healthcare data. And this is particularly relevant in light of recent concerns around sharing healthcare data for the NHS. Uh, and here we have a, just an example of an editorial by my colleague Ian Douglas, which uh, really tried to reassure the public about the ethical uses of their data for research. And of course, as soon as people opt out of sharing their data, those data are no longer representative of the population and we can no longer generalize um, from our finding to the general population. And so we really have a responsibility as researchers to use people's data responsibly and to involve them in the process and to share understanding of what we do and the risks that may be involved. So third, thinking about the categorization of ethnicity codes in your own research. So the standard census categories may not be the most appropriate for your specific re uh, research question. And indeed, we have a number of people that will answer other or not respond because they don't feel represented by those categories. And increasingly, overuse of the other category means that ethnicity is not being recorded optimally for every individual. And therefore, bespoke categories may be required. And so this is an approach we used in a study that I was involved in uh, several years ago at Queen Mary University, uh, which we looked at improving MMR vaccination rates in the local area. And so we had through uh, focus groups and qualitative work with the local community, had some understanding that the Somali community were particularly concerned about um, 
risks of using the MMR vaccine related to misconceptions from the published research linking MMR vaccination and autism. And so because we had high quality ethnicity recording in our local area, which was recorded at an individual level rather than in the 16 categories of the census, we were able to pull out uh, data for the Somali population separate from the other high level ethnic groups. And this graph just shows that the percentage of children receiving their first MMR vaccination in the required time period was far lower for the Somali ethnic group than for the other ethnic groups. And this would not have been possible without the ability to just aggregate ethnicity data in a way that was useful to our local context. And so this just shows um, an example of how our in, in intervention to improve vaccination rates in our local area worked and how we compared in Tower Hamlets in the blue line to England in the green line and London in the red line. So thanks to our engagement and designing an intervention which was locally relevant, we were able to show the fastest improvement in uh, vaccination rates in the whole country, uh, outstripping London and England as well. And this was because we were responsive to the local context and needs, and we were supported by high quality ethnicity data in our local setting. So moving on to some other examples from later in my work, this is some work I did with Open Safely during the COVID-19 pandemic, so a few years ago now. And we knew from very early on uh, in the news reports that there were striking ethnic disparities in COVID-19 related mortality, not just in the UK, but internationally. And so there were many hypotheses being generated about why there were such stark inequalities in the impacts of COVID in our multi-ethnic populations. So um, I led some work with the Open Safely Collaborative to look at ethnic differences along the pathway from infection to hospitalization, intensive care admission and death in 17 million adults using the Open Safely platform. And so for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Open Safely, I'll just give a brief detour into how research was conducted in this space. So traditionally, using uh, databases such as the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, researchers apply for access for specific projects and de-identified data is sent to the researchers, usually to be held in a secure trusted research environment, but relatively locally. And in the open safety model, we instead took our analysis to the data. So the data remained in the servers of the, of the data provider. So in the case of this study, um, the software provider TPP, and we wrote our scripts locally on dummy data and sent it to the data and results were spit out. And this allowed researchers to analyze the electronic health record data without ever having access to the raw data, therefore preserving privacy and security of the data. So this is just a model of what the Open Safely process looked like. The EHR provider kept the raw data. We developed our code locally on dummy data. We sent it to a de-identified copy of the data and the results were spit out. So there was no interaction between ourselves and the patient data. So our study of COVID-19 infection and outcomes was made possible by a wide variety of linkages, which are all available in real time. Uh, we had data uploaded, uh, updated on a weekly basis. And so we looked at a range of outcomes across the two waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a causal diagram, a DAG, a directed acyclic diagram, which shows the hypothesized mechanisms that we had in how ethnicity was related to COVID-19 events observed in the electronic health record. And so we know that ethnicity itself doesn't cause the outcomes, but rather it works through a range of pathways and factors, many of which are highlighted in this diagram. And so this helped us set out our hypotheses about the expected relationships we had uh, in our analysis. And here is an example of the risk factor profile of our population at baseline. And I just wanted to highlight here the stark ethnic differences in both expected and new data. So we can see that the proportion of people living in the most deprived uh, index of multiple deprivation quintile was highest amongst the black population and higher in all minority ethnic groups compared to the white population. 
We also, for the first time, were able to look at household size in our analysis, which was data that was not previously available to us in resources such as the clinical practice research data link. And we saw very usefully that South Asian populations in particular were overrepresented in large households, uh, defined as households of six or more people. And we hypothesized that this may be related to multi-generational living with grandparents, living with working age adults, living with children who were school age. And this may have had implications for uh, not only transmission of the virus, but also for sharing uh, household knowledge about ways of keeping safe or having community support and being in a very highly networked community, which is very supportive to people during the pandemic. And lastly, just looking at ethnic differences in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes at baseline, as expected, we saw that the prevalence was twice as high in South Asian compared to white populations and raised significantly in black and other minority ethnic groups. So here's a lar large, rather busy graph which shows our findings related to COVID-19 mortality. I don't need you to look at the details, but what I really wanted to highlight here was that thanks to the very large population size available in our open safety data set, we were able to actually look at ethnic differences not only across the five high level categories of white, South Asian, black, mixed and other, but we also were well powered to look at differences between the uh, ethnic subgroups as it were. And I've highlighted here the South Asian subgroups of Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi and other South Asian. And what was interesting here is that comparing the ethnic differences mortality between wave one and wave two, we saw that in wave two, most of the uh, differences between ethnic groups actually became smaller. So the disparities narrowed in wave two compared to wave one, except for the South Asian population where the disparities widen. We can see here that this was largely driven by the differences in the Bangladeshi community, which we wouldn't have been able to see otherwise with the high level data. So thinking finally about methods for dealing with missing data. So uh, there are of course many more sophisticated ways now, but we used a uh, multiple imputation for unknown ethnicity um, which is a useful uh, tool for exploring biases relating to missing ethnicity. And very thankfully, we saw that when we completed our analyses with the complete cases, so excluding people with missing ethnicity, and then the multiple, impu multiple imputation, we found very similar results. And we were able to conclude that there were no important biases introduced by limiting our study to those with recorded ethnicity. So, our research found some really useful hypotheses and patterns that we wouldn't have been able to uncover otherwise, but we know that the electronic health record data cannot tell us everything we need to know. We need to work closely with social scientists, policymakers to turn our data into actionable insights, which improve the health of the whole population. And I was lucky to have an opportunity to do this when working as a member of the SAGE ethnicity subgroup, where epidemiologists such as myself worked alongside clinicians, people in government, social scientists, and members of the public. And driven by our quantitative finding that the pandemic uh, inequalities widened for the Bangladeshi population in wave two compared to wave one, our qualitative colleagues led on some very uh, extensive work in Bangladeshi and Pakistani communities across the UK and uh, were able to write a report, which was mentioned in the Guardian here, but actually came to some very useful conclusions that poorer outcomes in the Pakistani and Bangladeshi populations in wave two in particular were due to the interaction of several factors, including health inequalities, disadvantages associated with occupation and their household circumstances, which may be related somewhat to our crude measure of household size that we were able to look at in our models. There were also concerns with barriers uh, to healthcare access and the potential influence of policy and practice on COVID-19 health seeking behavior. So turning now to diabetes, which is my day job outside of uh, COVID-19 work, there is also a big drive to address inequalities in this space as well. And we are moving towards personalized medicine approaches thanks to the availability of large scale linked multimodal data. So as mentioned before, a lot of the evidence for the care of diabetes is uh, based on studies uh, which do not include people of diverse ethnic backgrounds or from diverse global settings. However, we are now moving towards a stage of what we consider precision or stratified medicine, 
but we can group people into certain phenotypes or subgroups which are based on shared clinical, genomic, social and environmental characteristics. And we hope that this will be a move towards truly personalized medicine where individually tailored treatment uh, based on people's individual genetic makeup or other such data will become available. So we know that diabetes as a whole is actually a number of related conditions and is actually a complex multifactorial disease driven by genetic lifestyle and environmental factors. And we now know diabetes to be a heterogeneous range of conditions representing a range of metabolic disorders, which we call phenotypes. And there has been work led um, in, by colleagues in Sweden, but replicated internationally in other uh, settings, which has shown five main clusters of diabetes, uh, which we now consider to be uh, a very useful tool for differentiating risks of diabetes, but also outcomes and treatment effectiveness. And these phenotypes are useful for identifying people with, diff with different cl clinical characteristics, disease progression, and complications. So where does ethnicity intersect with understanding diabetes phenotypes? So ethnicity is often used as a proxy for diabetes phenotype. And we've seen studies published from colleagues internationally, which have identified a South Asian diabetes phenotype characterized by high intra-abdominal fat and high insulin resistance and also an African diabetes phenotype characterized by lean body size and reduced pancreatic insulin secretion. So we may be able to usefully use ethnicity when understanding diversity in diabetes phenotypes, progression and outcomes in different geographic settings. And of course, with the explosion of genomic data, we are making good use of these to understand the pathophysiology of diabetes in different populations in even greater depth. So over 600 genome-wide association studies have identified genetic variants explaining 19% of diabetes risk. However, due to the reasons mentioned before about lack of diversity, the benefits of these findings have so far largely gone to higher income countries, thus widening global health inequalities. So one of the ways that we are contributing to redressing this historic imbalance is using data from our local study, which is Genes and Health, a long-term health and genomic open access resource for British, Pakistani and Bangladeshi populations. And this study is led out of Queen Mary University, but has a number of partners across different universities and industry partners as well, and now has sites recruiting participants from East London, Bradford and Manchester. So one of the studies we've been able to do using this resource is look at polygenic risk scores in type 2 diabetes. So polygenic risk scores are a single score which predicts an individual's genetic predisposition for a certain disease. And these have mostly been developed and validated in people of white European ethnicity. And we wanted to understand how well these perform in British South Asians. So this is a study led by my colleague Sam Hodgson as part of his PhD work. He built uh, a polygenic risk score for type 2 diabetes for British South Asians from the Genes and Health study, and then used it in conjunction with the Q Diabetes Clinical Risk Score to see whether adding genetic information to electronic health record data improved the prediction of type 2 diabetes. And this work showed that the polygenic risk score specific to British South Asians identified distinct phenotypes of type 2 diabetes, which were not identifiable through the electronic health record data only. It also showed that the genetic loci of type 2 diabetes variants in European populations did not transfer to British, Pakistani and Bangladeshi populations. And actually, of those that transferred, only 33% shared causal variants, opening up a whole new area of research for the genetic drivers of type 2 diabetes diversity. So these are areas of growing interest and importance, but we still face some challenges. One is the cost of biomarker data. So not only in global settings, but also even in cost restrained settings such as the NHS, availability and use of biomarker data is not that common. So one question is, can we use simple clinical measurements to generate phenotypes similar to more sophisticated methods? 
And who has the ownership and leadership of the research agenda in these global challenges? So next steps in my own work and the work of my, my team going forward is whether looking at whether we can estimate treatment effectiveness by diabetes phenotype and ethnicity, and how we can use routine electronic health records to emulate and extend clinical trials and observational data, and to think about causal approaches to disentangle the role of genetic, clinical, and migration and environmental related factors on type 2 diabetes risk and outcomes. So in conclusion, we're very lucky to be living in a time where the quality and quantity of health data is rapidly increasing worldwide. And we have a novel opportunity to use these data to understand inequalities, particularly in the UK, but in other settings where these data are available. And we, we can use these data to tackle inequalities, to reduce gaps, and ensure that the needs of diverse populations are met. And in the meantime, ethnicity and phenotype stratified approaches provide a crucial next step towards true precision medicine approaches. So thank you very much. That's all from me. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Rohini. Um, that was really interesting. I think we've got a question already in the chat, um, which you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask in person if you like. I think it's Jackie Marshall. Otherwise, I can read it out. Okay. Um, um, so I, I should confess I'm a biochemist by training, not a social scientist at all. So this may be a field specific uh, misunderstanding, but, um, you know, I'm used to having my hands on data. And so the open safely approach is really interesting. Um, and I'm wondering, are there particular things that you have to do differently to validate the data? Because it's just you don't just send it off and see what comes out, but then you, you ideally want to validate it some way, but I don't know what's usual in your field. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so validation is definitely a thing that is usual in our field, perhaps not in this exact same way as in yours. And I would say one of the biggest challenges of using Open Safely is that huge learning curve in how do you clean data and how are you assured about your analyses without actually seeing the data in real life. So I also am touching my data and I also find it very jarring not to be able to do that. Um, so one of the things that we had to do in the initial first steps is actually you have to write in a lot of tests, I suppose. So all the things that you would generally eyeball in your data or play around with, you have to formally code and say, please tell me the distributions of these variables. Please tell me the missing data. So you, you can do all those things. It's just much more, a bit more laborious because you have to actually like code it, send it away and wait for it to come back. But that's the only added step in terms of validation. You can still, you know, with some patience, go through the same steps of comparing to other data sources. Thank you. It's a lovely talk. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Has anybody put their hand up or pop something in the chat? I have a question about open safety otherwise. Um, I was just wondering, because I know it was kind of came out of COVID, this particular, mm -hmm. um, but is there, does it still exist? Are people, are still people able to use it now? Or is that model really only because of the COVID um, situation? Yes, so it absolutely still exists. It was, yes, initially created in response to the pandemic on behalf of NHS England. And until very recently could only be used for COVID-19 related research. But just before Christmas, they got um, permission or license for a freestanding platform. So now anyone can use Open Safely to answer any question. So definitely have yes. a place if you're interested. Such an interesting resource, definitely. But, yeah. um, do we have any? Yes, we've got a question from Leandra. Hi, Rini. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, I have a question that is quite general, um, but as someone who's trying to work in this area myself, and I, I feel like I spent a lot of time um, convincing other people that this is important, and then people always ask us what um, they can do and everything. Um, so for you, what would you like to see change in um, in this kind of general field? What what are you hoping for um, that is like a broader, a broader change that you're working towards, maybe, or that you're hoping for in other people's work? So I think one thing that would, I think, certainly make the work that I do easier is better linkage across data sets and settings. So we have very rich electronic health record data. 
but we don't currently have a good way to link them to social or census data in England, at least. I think in Wales and Scotland, they have much better systems set up. But for example, you know, we were really certain household size, for example, in the COVID-19 work. But what would really have been useful is understanding, you know, household composition, how much people earn, where they work, you know, how much schooling they have, all of those factors which influence our social interactions with the world. If we could bring those data with our health record data together, that would be really valuable. Um, I have colleagues that work on childhood immunizations or, you know, and so things that takes place in school, things that take place in school settings, we also don't really understand. And I don't, someone else may know better than me. I imagine it's technically possible, but I think there's a lot of potential political will and wrangling to be done about who gets to hold the data, who has to bring their data from somewhere else. And those all seem like quite solvable problems. Thank you. I think uh, kind of better linkages between data would be uh, amazing. Yeah. I did my master's in um, Denmark and the linkage there is just kind of absolutely crazy, as you probably well know. Um, we've got a question from Tom Yates. Please feel free to unmute him. Sure. Um, thanks for the talk. I, I was interested in imp imputing ethnicity and um, I was just kind of wondering from the data whether you could tell us a bit about uh, you know what what variables the model is using to predict the, uh, uh, unobserved ethnicity is it kind of yeah, attendance or comorbidities or you know how, how do you it seems quite a kind of uh personal and kind of complex thing to kind of yeah absolutely yes so the the approach that we took in our open safety team and i'm not a statistician so very happy to be corrected on this but the approach that we did is that we imputed ethnicity using all of the variables that went into our fully adjusted regression model so in this case it was um age sex deprivation comorbidities yes consultations uh the region in which the gp practice was in the household size variable um i think those are the main ones that we used to impute ethnicity. But I have to say, you might have seen, I only did it for the five category ethnicity because when I tried to do it for 16 category ethnicity, it ran for three weeks and then failed. So I don't know how good open safety is for big AI type work yet. And, and do you know which of those sort of inputs were the ones that kind of resulted in the prediction, which, which, which what carried kind of weight in the imputation? Um, I mean, you could imagine, you know, uh, you know, in London, you know, uh, you know the, the, the places where people live might ca carry away so I guess age distribution but do you, know, do you know what it was that was kind of yielding the the predicted ethnicity yeah I don't off the top of my head but actually all of the code that we ran or ever, the code everyone runs in open safely is all available on github so I could definitely go back and have a have a look <laughs> thank you great are there any other questions Feel free to unmute or pop something in the chat. No, great. There's also a couple of links. Um, oh, yeah, somebody's raised their physical hand. Love that. <laughs> yeah, feel free to unmute and um, ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thanks, thanks to the presenter for the lovely presentation. All right, my name is Jeremiah Gamchirai, as you can see from, from the name there. Um, I'm a master's in health economics student, so my understanding may still be limited, but uh, I hope it will make sense. So can this can this model be extended? You gave us an example of diap uh, diabetes mellitus. Mm -hmm. Can the model be extended to you know, more or less chronic conditions, hypertension, cancer, and all that, and have same kind of predictable outcomes? Thank you. Yes, I think absolutely. I think it's a, a general model that you can use for different conditions. And I think um, diabetes is or lends itself particularly well to this because the term diabetes is a misnomer. It's not one condition. It's actually a spectrum of conditions. Uh, but certainly for hypertension, this is something that a colleague of mine is looking at. Um, so looking at basically uh, phenotypes of hypertension and treatment response. And her work, she's actually particularly interested in uh, predicting hypertension outcomes in people of mixed ethnicity because they're the largest growing ethnic group in the UK, certainly. And actually, we don't know much about this population in terms of their long-term risks and whether the, the, at least the kind of genetic or phenotypic characteristics are more like one of the parent ethnic groups or the other. So there's a lot of scope to expand this approach. Great, thank you. <clears throat> 
And thank you again. Thanks very much, Rahini. Um, it was a lovely talk. Uh, there's a couple of uh, links that have been posted in the chat by my colleague Vanessa, um, so you can find information on Dishi and also our Twitter. And if you're not on our Slack space, you're very welcome to join us there. Um, we, uh, yeah, we'll be posting this recording online, so you can refer back to it. Um, and we're hoping to have our uh, next uh, seminar series um, in early March. And so we'll be sending around details uh, shortly about that. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Could you join me again to uh, thank Rahini for the talk? Um, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your Monday <laughs> and beginning of your week. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you all.